and we want to note here uh, the references uh, to uh, paths of righteousness and righteousness uh, in uh, this section. Proverbs 4, uh, verse 10. Sorry, let me get an ESV. So we're reading on page uh, 637. Hear, my son, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of righteousness or uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn, from, turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vi vigilance or diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech. Put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forwards and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your feet away from evil. And then we're turning back to uh, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel and chapter 12, page 282, and uh, this is um, Samuel's, what's called Samuel's farewell uh, address. Um, it's after uh, Israel has chosen uh, her king, and the Lord um, is now addressing Israel through Samuel, and we want to read from verse 19 to verse 25, where we have this phrase again, uh, for your name's sake, or uh, so the same phrase with only the different uh, uh, pronoun. Page 282, and all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil, to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, Do not be afraid. Uh, you have done all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with, your heart, with all your heart. Do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things 
he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Amen. So today we're thinking about this great theme of restoration that is summed up in verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, you'll find the text on page 550 in the church uh, Bible. And we saw that the basic meaning of this word restores uh, is to turn back, to turn back. Uh, and uh, of course, behind this, uh, as we touched on briefly this morning, lies the picture of the shepherd who goes out after the sheep that have strayed. And there are always stray sheep when you have a flock of sheep. And he has to find them and he has to turn them back and to bring them back. And of course with that beautiful parable that Jesus told of the shepherd going out, finding the lost sheep in the thicket and um, dislodging it from the thorns, the briars. And you think when you work uh, and seek to retrieve from, being, from briars, you get attacked yourself by the briars. So this personal cost there, and then he lifts the sheep and puts it on his shoulders. Again, think of the effort and the activity and the sacrifice in that and carries it home. Uh, and uh, we saw that uh, then spiritually the Lord restores us from. He restores us uh, from uh, our daily sin. He restores us from backsliding. That sin that has been allowed to go on confessed uh, over uh, days, weeks, months, and damages our walk with the Lord until it's faced up to. And then we saw he restores from discouragement as well, which can come uh, to uh, the Christian uh, and to the church in a variety of ways. We thought about what we're restored through. We saw we're restored through the word and we're restored through prayer. On the basis that Christ uh, is the one uh, who died for our sins and our restoration. And then uh, we thought about restored to this morning. We're restored to obedience to God. We're restored to fellowship with his people. We're restored to witness uh, in and to uh, the world. And we were... Um, Teasing all of that out uh, in the light of this phrase, he restores my soul. And interpreting that and, and uh, teaching and applying that in the light of wider scripture. And so this evening we come to the second part of the verse. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So here is... You think of the, the shepherd, the sheep uh, brought back, uh, put in the flock, and now uh, the sheep has got to journey after the shepherd within uh, the flock. Uh, and that's uh, the call to us um, as we uh, think about this passage, or these, these, this verse this evening, these words. And then as we leave the table and return uh, to our homes, our callings, our communities. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so I'm going to continue with the theme restored or restoration. And thinking now that we are first of all restored into paths of righteousness. A shepherd will not lead his sheep into territory that is dangerous. Either dangerous because it is soft and boggy mm -hmm. and mucky and wet and the sheep are going to get uh, horned there uh, and 
uh, their feet are going to uh, get damaged, potentially they're going to pick up um, all kinds of parasites. So that's one aspect. The shepherd won't lead his sheep there, nor will he lead his sheep into a, an area where he knows there are lots of wild animals. That would be foolish. That's to ask for trouble. And sometimes we say to our children um, when we're talking to them about how they conduct themselves in school, make sure you're not someone who walks into trouble and invites trouble because of uh, those that you associate with or those where you go or what you say or what you do. So the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he restores us, well, where is he going to lead us? He's not going to lead us to places, though there are many places where, which are dangerous and which are very difficult terrain in uh, this uh, world, in this life. Uh, for example, uh, a young Christian in their teenage years or their early 20s and they're looking for a spouse in life, it would be utter foolishness for them to think, well, uh, I can go into the nightclub or I can go uh, into that kind of environment wherever it is, where there's immorality, where there's alcohol, where there's drugs, where there's blasphemy, and think, well, I can go there and I can make good choices there and I can meet someone there who will be of good for me. No, that's not to walk or to be led in paths of righteousness. And so the, the question we've got to keep asking ourselves as we journey through life and as we um, uh, sense needs in our lives, uh, as we make decisions in our lives, we've got to ask the question, is this a path of righteousness? A path of righteousness. Because the Lord has restored me and he's restored me to walk in paths of righteousness. Now, what do we mean by that phrase, uh, paths of righteousness? Well, at a very basic level, we can say it's right paths. The right paths and the wrong paths to take in life. And we read earlier from Proverbs chapter 4. And the whole context there in chapter 3 and chapter 4 is a warning, and into chapter 5 as well, is a warning to the young man to watch out for the immoral woman. Because she wants to lead the man of God, the godly man, into um, wrong paths. Um, and so, as opposed to him continuing in right paths. But um, it's even more than right and wrong because we realise that our world has its own definition of right and wrong. And sometimes that is very skewed. And indeed, Scripture warns us uh, of a day when evil will be called good and good will be called evil. In other words, things are turned upon their heads. And so, if we uh, measure the right paths that we are to walk in in life by others, we have no guarantee that we are walking the right path. Uh, and indeed, there is every likelihood in this day and age that uh, if not the path in its entirety, then there will be points in that path uh, and places in that path which are openly and, and, uh, uh, openly and evidently not right. So there's a higher standard and it, it's, it's that that we want to note here. It's not just right paths, but it's actually righteous paths. Paths of righteousness. Paths marked by righteousness. So where does that standard come from? Well, that's the standard that's set forth by God. It's defined by who God is. 
and is to find in the revelation of God. The paths of righteousness are the paths that God sets forth for his people in his word. Uh, and uh, we are to follow in those paths. It's very interesting that when you look at this word uh, in the Old Testament, it talks, for example, in Psalm 4, verse 6, about righteous sacrifices. And so it literally is sacrifices of righteousness. In other words, that was the sacrifice that the Lord wanted. And that's where Cain went wrong in the beginning. It wasn't a sacrifice of righteousness. It wasn't the sacrifice that God required. It was the sacrifice of his own imagination. I bring of the fruit of the field. And God, well, he's either got a lump it or like it, as we would say locally. And of course, God did not like it because it was not what he had revealed at the end of Genesis chapter 3. That sacrifice always had to involve the shedding of blood. And that's why Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Because it was a sacrifice of righteousness. It involved the shedding of the blood of the animals. So uh, we read on in uh, the scriptures and we find that there's such a thing uh, as weights of righteousness. Weights and measures. Uh, and anyone who's involved in business uh, will from time to time have a visit from the weights and measures man or woman. They'll turn up with the uh, petrol pumps unannounced and they will check that the measure that has been uh, paid out uh, or dispensed uh, according to the pump is actually the full litre. And that the uh, petrol station is not uh, selling petrol at a little bit less than other places, but it's also giving you a, a shorter measure. Yeah. Have you ever said, have you ever heard someone say, well, can I buy a petrol there and I buy a petrol here, and the petrol over there doesn't seem to go as far as the petrol over here? Well, you see, in the Old Testament, human nature was not any different. And the Lord said to his people, you've got to get weights and measures that are righteous, that are by my standard, that are true and that are just. And then when you read on again in the Old Testament, you find, uh, sorry, that was Deuteronomy 25 verse 15, if you want the reference there, righteous weights and measures. Uh, then uh, Psalm 52 verse 5 talks about Speech of righteousness, righteous speech. And so again, there's a distinction made in speech between what is righteous, what honours God, truth, uh, honesty, um, the absence of deceit, um, and dealing with people and speaking to people in a way that... Um, honours them as a person, as God does with us. Though we can be as stupid as the sheep at times, in our choices and in our actions, the Lord doesn't speak to us as if we were stupid sheep. He, that's not how he relates to us. He always relates to us as his image bearer. And so there is righteous speech. And then we sign this morning from Psalm 118 verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness. The gates of righteousness. And um, wanting to enter into uh, the, the path and the way that uh, is set by God. Not... Um, his own way or her own way trying to reach God according to their own imagination and so brethren if you've been if, if you're connecting all of those together you'll see that 
didn't matter what the Israelites went to do, they went to worship. Now you've got to bring a righteous sacrifice. They went to work. You've got to deal with people in righteous measures and weights. And um, as they talked to one another at home, there had to be righteous speech. Uh, and so, what are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing we're restored into paths of righteousness. In other words, the standard for every aspect of my life, from the moment I wake in the morning to the moment I fall asleep at night, has got to be righteousness. Not my own righteousness, not what other people think is right or wrong, but the righteousness that God has established. The righteousness that reflects his being and his nature. Alec Mateer has put it this way, paths that match his righteous nature and lead to his righteous goals. You see, his goal is to remake you that you fully reflect and perfectly reflect his image. Now, if you're going to do that, if we're going to become that, we won't become that by unrighteous words and actions and activities. And so... In many respects, it brings us back again to the Ten Commandments and the working out of those Ten Commandments in life because that is the, 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 the reflection of God um, and of what God is like and of how God um, wants us to live. Do you remember the Lord said on Mount Sinai, to Israel, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of bondage, out of sin. And then he said, you shall, and you shall not. So, as we leave this table, brethren, as we continue in life, uh, in our families, in our workplace, uh, with our siblings, um, with our uh, communities we're always to think of the paths of righteousness the Lord leads me there and that's where I'm to walk and in all my dealings with my fellow man I am to reflect his righteousness it's a mighty task isn't it it's a mighty task but you see the point is that we're not left to do it by ourselves. He leads me. And um, that's the sense as well, I believe, that we should, uh, that he enables me. He enables me. And so our enablement comes from the Christ who saves us. It's the Christ who asks us and enables us to live in paths of righteousness. <coughs> so we're restored into paths of righteousness. There are some people who try to say, I'm saved, and their life hasn't changed, and they're acceptable to God, they think. Brethren, Scripture does not support that. Unless someone is endeavouring and striving as we have in our fourth term of vow of membership to live a life consistent to walk in paths of righteousness to follow in paths of righteousness they have no basis for saying that they are saved by Christ but then uh, not only restored into but restored for restored for What's the great goal of our lives? Well, the psalmist says, restored for his name's sake. And um, that um, is both how God is at work in the world 
and it is how we are to live in the world. God is the God who has made all things and upholds all things and is redeeming all things for his name's sake. It's to, uh, it's to uh, show the God that he is both um, in his grace and in his judgment. The grace to save and judgment of those who are not saved. And you have to have both grace and uh, judgment uh, together in order to reflect accurately and fully the character of God. The concept that is abroad today that the God of the New Testament is the God of pure love. Love no matter what happens, no matter who you are, what you do, he is love. And the God of the Old Testament is an angry God and an unrighteous God and uh, needs to be appeased. And setting God of the Old and the New Testament uh, against himself is utterly wrong. In the Old Testament, God is both love and righteous and just. And in the New Testament, that balance has not changed in the being of God. And unless we hold forth his grace and his wrath or judgment, um, then we are not representing and portraying God actor accurately. And um, we're not uh, revealing him or communicating him would be a better way of putting it as he is revealed in scripture. So God is at work for his name's sake, displaying his character uh, and um, displaying uh, his glory and always working in such a way to that will um, uphold who he is and um, that's not an unworthy thing of God so people think is that not a selfish thing is that not unworthy of God that God just somehow just interested in himself and, and who he is and, and his glory well no it isn't uh, you and I you're concerned about your name, aren't you? You're concerned, and I'm concerned about my name. If somebody starts maligning your name uh, and uh, misrepresenting what you've said and who you are and what you've done, will you say, shrug your shoulders and say, doesn't matter? Of course you won't. That's why we've in our courts and our land of our land and the laws of our land, even the ungodly know that there's such a thing as libel and there's such a thing as slander, which destroys the name of people. That case between the footballers, wives, that is, I don't know where it is now in court, or who won or what stage is that, but it was in, in the headlines a couple of weeks ago. And it was a, it's all about whose who's name here? Uh, is, is being damaged and reputation and if we think about the God who is absolutely holy and righteous should he not be concerned for his name for the sake of his name for the honour of his name that people would grasp accurately and uh, rightly his name and you see that's what was coming out there in 1st Samuel chapter 12 verses 19 to 25 Israel has sinned in a variety of ways and uh, you know the people begin to realize why do you put up with this God why do you bother with this and Samuel says he does it for his name's sake because if God was to abandon Israel, 
He wouldn't be the God of everlasting love. He wouldn't be the God of faithfulness. He'd be like the man who divorces his wife. Um, and God does not divorce his people. Uh, so Samuel says, yes, I do recognize you've, all done, you've done all of that. And God recognizes that. And you would have expected Samuel to have said then next, and you ought to be shaking in your boots. We, that's what we would have been saying. But Samuel says, the Lord will continue to deal with you for his <coughs> name's sake. How wonderful that is for you and me as believers. Those times when the devil tells us you're not worth it. God is finished with you. And why will God bother with you anymore? And we need to say to the devil, for his name's sake. It's not for anything in me. Absolutely right. But it's for his name's sake. He will continue to show grace to me, to you, to us. He will forgive us. For his name's sake. And brethren, this is full of, of practical uh, pastoral application for us as well. When we sin and we are conscious that we have fallen grievously. Or we are battling with that ongoing sin. And we've been battling with it for years and years. And you think you've made progress. And just like that. It hits you again like a ton of bricks. And what are we to do then? We're to say, Lord, forgive me for your name's sake. We can plead the sake of the Lord's name, the honour of the Lord's name for our own lives. And in the light of our own sin. And I think you see Moses doing that, do you not? Whenever Israel sinned, remember back there with the golden calf. And what heights they'd been with God. And here now they are worshipping this calf. They've fallen into idolatry and into adultery. And what does Moses do? He pleads with God. He says, Lord, what are the nations going to say? If you, if you abandon these people, yes, you'd be righteous uh, in, your, in and of yourself. And you're ter perfectly justified in doing it. But what is it going to say about your name? That you're not faithful. That you can't be dependent on. And you see the thing about God is he is utterly, utterly dependent on. You and I, we will let one another down. There's times that we will be disappointed in one another. But brethren, we've never any occasion to be disappointed in the Lord. If we find ourselves at a point where we're disappointing the Lord, there's something not right in our thinking. And we need to get that straightened again. Because he is righteous. He is holy. He is gracious. He is love. He is steadfast. Uh, and he always acts for his name's sake and so um, Latir again puts it like this his leadership does not arise from anything that is in us or that we have done it arises only uh, from what is in his own heart or his own nature and so uh, he restores us not only into the paths of righteousness and says now walk in that narrow way that leads to life everlasting not the broad way, but also he says, I'm doing this for my name's sake. And yes, what's for his name's sake is always for your best and for my best. And even to be able to see that, brethren, when things go wrong in our lives and things that we wouldn't choose, maybe issues of health, uh, issues of that arise in work, and we've maybe had disappointments 
or in relationships or whatever and to be able to take that view that says well God is Lord over all things and all that he does and all that he allows think of the death of his son and he did it for his name's sake and what he does and allows in your life and in my life again it is for his name's sake and that will always be for our blessing so brother let's remember restoration into paths of righteousness and restoration for his name's sake. Amen.